Welcome. Uh, this is your first time here. I'm Pastor Albert, and uh, we're going through the Gospel of John. The series is titled, uh, Hello, I Am Jesus. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand, and one of the ushers can go ahead and give you one. The rest of us, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 14, please. This is um, quite a series. The book of John, the Gospel of John is just, uh, I don't know, I think it's up there. I think it's my favorite now. It used to be Romans. But the Gospel of John just lays it out for you. You know, it just increases your faith. It is what it says it is in John 21. It says that these things were written that you might believe. And that word believe right there in the, in, in, in the Greek, it's, in the form it is, it's sort of a, an active verb there, a continuing verb, sort of, that you might continue to believe. So it's not just for new believers, but for mature believers. It's not for those that are just coming to salvation, but for those that have been saved. This is an awesome book. This chapter, um, chapter 14, there's a lot of theology, and I'm not going to cover each and every, I'm not going to dig deep into it. We can't. There's just too much in there, but we will scratch the surface on a lot of them. The, the theme for today is hope, hope, hope for troubled hearts, kind of like Greg Laurie's book or, or DVD, right? Hope for hurting hearts. But last week uh, on John chapter 13, we saw that Jesus told his disciples that he's leaving and they can't go where he's going for, and for now, right? He's taking off. He's going to die, obviously. That's what he was referring to. He tells them that he was uh, going to be betrayed, right? The triple, uh, what was it? 3D pain, uh, double cross deserted and denied, right? He was double-crossed by, uh, by Judas, denied by Peter three times, and deserted by the rest of the guys. They, they ditched him, right? That was, uh, that was, I believe that's one of, the, one of the tough things, aside from the cross, that Jesus had to endure. So now, in a sense, he's, gonna, he's sort of going to do his living will here. He's going to give them six or seven things, six or seven objects of hope, right? One of them is going to be hope through a, a hope of heaven, and then the rapture, the hope of the rapture, and all these things, right? And we'll get to them if you're taking notes. Go ahead and do that. I'll cover them. Uh, I'll review them at the end of the chapter as well. Let me start off with a little, uh, a little uh, joke slash uh, quote here. It's called, uh, My Living Will. It goes like this. Last night, my kids and I were sitting in the living room trying to have a serious talk. I told them, I never want to live in a vegetative state dependent on a machine and fluids to keep me alive. I went on to tell them, if it ever comes to this, just pull the plug and let me go in peace. So my kids, they get up off of the couch, they unplug my computer, and throw out my coffee. <laughs> if you're, if, if, I mean, you might have a living will now. Uh, some, some of us uh, don't have one yet. But if you had one, what would you leave your loved ones behind with, right? Jesus here is going to leave them with hope as I mentioned before. I probably would leave back uh, my Keurig, you know, my, uh, my library of books, my debt for sure, you know, my car payments and all that stuff. Um, but these guys are distressed, as I mentioned earlier. You know, they heard that Jesus is taking off, right? They're, they're, their best friend is taking off. He's been to betrayed. They think that the plan has been sort of, uh, you know, hijacked. And he's going to sort of comfort them now in this, this very chapter of hope. It's been said that human beings can live for 40 days without food, four days without water, and four minutes without air. But we cannot live for four seconds without hope. And, and, and the point to that is you can be a, a Marine, a Navy SEAL, right? You can hold your breath for 10, 15 minutes or do awesome feats. But if there's no hope behind that, no hope to live, what's the point of it, right? Hope is always that, that moving point. And that's what Jesus is going to get to here. He's leaving. Yeah, he's being deserved, but it's all for the plan. It's all for the better. And he's going to comfort their hurting hearts. Let's start with verses 1 to 6. I titled, Keep Calm and Reserve On. Verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. He's going to tell them this. This phrase is going to be heard here as I, as I just read it and later on close to the end of the chapter. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have 
told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Verse 4, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if we go back to verse 1, right there, just in verse 1, we see the cure for a troubled heart. The first cure there, what is it? He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. Now, a lot of maybe cults and, and those that are unaware of what the scriptures actually are saying, simply at face value here, might run with this and say, well, Jesus is saying that he's not God, right? You believe in God, believe also in me. But that's not what he's trying to say. He's trying to tell him, look, the same way you trust in God, trust in me. The same way you trust in the Father, trust in the Son, okay? I'm just as trustworthy as the Father. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him, Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Philippians 2, 5 and 6 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So there's no contradiction here. The, the thing he's trying, he's trying to redirect their faith towards him, right? Believe my word, right? Jesus kept on saying, you know, I only do what I see the Father doing, right? He's speaking for, for the Father there as well, right? He's claiming trustworthiness. And that's the first cure for a troubled heart. Have faith in Jesus Christ. We're conquerors because he conquered first, right? Through his death. Verse 2 here, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. There's a lot of space in heaven. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Right? So he's got a five-star suite for you if you're born again up in heaven. Right? He's got a special place for you. And that's comforting. Right? That's comforting for a troubled heart. He's reassuring them of what? Of heaven. Right? He's going to go. And what else, what else is he going to do? He's going to come back for them. Verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What hope is this? The hope of heaven, right? It's been said that heaven is not just a destination, but a motivation, right? That's also a, an awesome saying. It's not found in the Bible, but it should motivate us because we're eventually going to be with the Lord. No matter what you're going through now, if you have cancer or your loved ones are, are, are sick and are about to die, right, or you have money problems, you know, you fill in the blank. You might be going through stuff, but just know that eventually you're going to end up with the Lord in heaven, right? These guys were troubled. They were scared. Well, what happened in chapter 3? No, actually, in Luke's gospel, right, yeah, Luke tells, uh, Jesus tells a uh, Peter, you know, the, Satan wants to punch your face in. Well, he doesn't say it like that. He says, uh, uh, Satan wants to swift you as wheat, right? He wanted to scatter them, right? Not just Peter, but the rest of the guys. If we see there, the word you is in plural. So, yeah, they were pretty, I'm pretty sure they were pretty discouraged. They were going through having a, a troublesome time. But he has heaven ready for them and waiting, right? They had reserved, their, their, their spot was being reserved by Jesus Christ. Uh, a couple years back, uh, my... Uh, my Cynthia's parents, my in-laws, they, they used to own a restaurant in San Bernardino, right? It was called a Ted's Short Stop. So it was sort of a, a mix of Mexican food and Chinese food. So you can go for either or. Um, but it always got packed, especially during lunch hour. And uh, when we used to go visit, we would just sort of, you know, because I know the guys inside, I can have the back door open for me, right? And that's another reason I really like to go over there, because I get free food, right? Who doesn't? Um, so anyway, I would go in and, you know, I make some carne asada fries, what, some fish tacos, all this. And, and, and it was there. It was reserved for me, right? Jesus is the guy that has your place reserved for you. Kind of like Valentine's, right? Or Mother's Day, if you've been here in Yuma, you want to go somewhere, whether it's Olive Garden, uh, what is it, the Garden Cafe, mm, all these other restaurants, right? One time we, we uh, everything was packed. We didn't reserve our place in time, so we went to the queue or the the Quichon Casino over here, because they have a restaurant there, we go, it's the same thing. Everything is packed. Jesus is the guy that has that, that place ready for you, reserved for you. And that, that gives hope. That gives people hope, knowing that one day that Jesus has a special place for you in heaven. And again, verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
Not only that, not only is he had, does he have a place for them, he's going to come and get them, right? He's going to come and, what is it, the, the Rapture Airlines, number one. It, it's, it, this is what he's referring to. I'm coming to get you, first class. First Thessalonians 4 tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. There's that, that Greek word harposto, the snatching away of the saints. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. This is all, the rapture is also referred to as what? The blessed hope, right? Because it does give us hope. Not just of the place, but the way we get there as well. Well, how, how else can we apply the rapture to? It gives us security, right? No matter what happens here. And it motivates us, as I said before. Now let's go to verses 4 through 6. Verse 6 is just powerful. You know, one of my favorite verses, a lot of teachers, t-shirts um, have this verse. But let's start in verse 4. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus answers Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is just such a powerful verse. Just exclusiveness here. Is there, there's just an absoluteness here that Jesus is the only way. And it's sort of a contradiction to what is taught in public schools today, or how I like to call them government schools, state schools. You know, there's just a, an agenda behind it. And the agenda is, the thing that's being taught is relativism, right? You're okay, you're okay, and everybody's okay, right? But if you give an absolute, you're wrong, right? You're against, they're against that. They don't like the one way. People read this verse as, as if it said, verse 6, I am a way. It does not say a way. It says the way, right? So it tells us two things, right? There's only one way, and that one way is Jesus Christ. There's no real other way around it. Acts 4.12 backs this up. It says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's through Jesus Christ alone. It's, and it's, found out through, it's laid out throughout the scriptures. Always it's Jesus Christ. He's the only way. The truth and the life, as it says here. But what's the difference? How do you define Christianity or biblical Christianity compared to the rest of those beliefs? Because there's hundreds, if not thousands, of, of beliefs out there, Right? How do, you, how do you sort of narrow it down? And most of you know this already, but I'll say it again. It really goes back to faith versus works, right? Now, there are those religions that say, well, Jesus, but you got to add this to it, right? Jesus, but you got to light some candles after you die so you can get out of purgatory eventually, right? Or Jesus plus uh, getting baptized in, in a Mormon temple, right? Jesus plus this, but the Bible says Jesus plus nothing. It's Jesus alone throughout the scriptures. What does Ephesians 2, 8, 9 say? We're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest none should boast, right? Let me give you four, four examples of, or four popular cults and religions. The first one I'll mention is Islam, right? How do they, what do they say, what do you have to do to get to heaven? They say you've got to perform five pillars, right? Five pillars of faith. Well, number one, profess faith in Allah. You've got to continue, uh, you've got to have a prayer there. You've got to give 2.5% of their wealth. You've got to fast regularly. And you got to visit the city of Mecca at least one time in your life. Those are works that you have to do. And not only that, but they say that still doesn't confirm your, your ticket to heaven. You know, they, they say the same thing that the world says. You sort of got to, your good works have to outweigh your bad works. But then they say, look, um, if, you, if you do jihad, right, if you, if you commit jihad, that'll sort of tip the scales to your favor. You know, that'll get you, that'll possibly get you into heaven, Right? That's still the same thing, the same life from the beginning. You versus what God has already done. The Mormons, it's not so different, right? What do they say? You, you have to baptize in the Mormon temple. Um, if you don't get baptized in the Mormon temple, if you happen to die before that, well, one of your relatives in the future can uh, get baptized for you, right? Baptism of the dead. Uh, you got to be a member of the LDS church. Uh, do temple rituals. Believe that uh, Joseph Smith is a true prophet from God. All these things, they get added on. To grace. Here's a, a quote from one from the Book of Mormon, Second Nephi 2523. It says, For we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God, for we know that it is by grace that we're saved. That sounds pretty good, right? But that's not the problem. The problem is what they add after this verse. It says, 
that is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. And that changes the whole thing, right? The same way that how the Jehovah's Witnesses add 1a to John 1.1, 1, 1, right? The beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. But they add that it was a God. That changes the whole thing, right? We're adding to God's scriptures here, right? It's not what, what you can do, but what God has already done, right? Pretty simple. Relationship versus uh, religion. And then there's one of, I think this is the most popular religion out there, right? The religion of the sincere and good person. You know, I'm, I'm a good guy. I haven't hurt anybody. I go to church sometimes, you know, or... You know, um, I try to do good to people, right? It, it goes back to the same thing, you know, good works outweighing your bad works. Here's one of my favorite verses. It's found in Romans 4, chapter, uh, verse 5 and 6. But to him who does not work but believes, on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also described, the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness. And if you don't get it the first time, he'll tell you again, apart from works, right? It's not about works. It's not about what you can do. And we forget that sometimes. This is a good reminder. Let's continue here in verse 7 to 11. Like father, like son. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Now notice Philip is going to start talking now. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. What is this trying to say? This is just saying that Jesus reveals the Father. Same thing that, that John said earlier in John chapter 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Right? So, so Jesus is basically telling Philip, because Philip was one of his first disciples. If you go back to John uh, chapter 1 and 2, you'll see that Philip was the first guy that sort of left John the Baptist and, and went to start following Jesus. And he's basically telling him, you've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't get this. I've been trying to tell you all this time. You know, you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Right? He, he perfectly displays the, the Father, the character of the Father there, right? He's not saying that Jesus is the Father, you know, or that the Holy Spirit is the Son and the Son is, is the Holy Spirit. That's not what it's saying. That's a false teaching. You know, there, there's one being, one God and three persons. Very different. Let's continue here. In verse uh, 12 to 14, we're going to see the power behind prayer. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Let's start here in verse 12. It says, and greater works, right? They were going to do greater works. Does that mean that these works were going to be better quality, or they were going to be greater in quantity? I think it's talking about quantity, because... If you remember Jesus' ministry, his three-year ministry there was just in Judea, Galilee, and all that, Samaria. But when the, when the Holy Spirit came, right, in Jerusalem there, the disciples were scattered. They went out to the other ends of the, of the world, right? They spread the gospel, and you and I are evidence of that. It's gone to us as well. So when it's referring to, in verse 12 here, to greater works, I'm, I'm thinking it's talking about quantity, not quality. You know, they could not resurrect themselves back, bring themselves back from the death, dead, obviously. And you're going to see this word greater throughout the, the scriptures in verse 14 here as well. And we'll, we'll touch on it again. Most assuredly I say to you, who, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. He's sort of uh, implying, you know, you're going to do greater works, but he's not necessarily telling them the Holy Spirit is going to come and empower you to do these things. Look at verse 13 and 14 again. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, a lot of times we think, okay, whatever prayer it is, as long as I add Jesus to it at the end of the prayer, it's all good. It's going to happen, right? And I've tried that. It doesn't work, you know? You can say, in Jesus' name, right? Say it loud and, and, or whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter, right? 
unless, of course, it's under the God's under God's will, right? This is not a, a sort of a, a clever uh, magical word that will answer that I will make God do what you say. How does he tell the disciples to pray? No, your will be done. It's always God's will. We have to align ourselves to God's will. And it was already in God's will for them to do greater works in extent already. That's why they did them. But obviously it's implying prayer here. It's implying for them to do their part. It's sort of like salvation. We don't know those that are going to get saved. However, Romans tells us we have to go out and tell them, right? What does Paul say? Unless someone tells them, how will they hear? Same way here. Unless we pray, how will we know what God has for us? That's how, that's how I see it. There's a story about a little boy that had been sent to his room because he had been bad. A short time later, he came out and said to his mother, I've been thinking about what I did, and I said a prayer. That's fine, she said. If you ask God to make you good, he will help you. The boy said, oh, I didn't ask him to help me be good. I asked him to help you, help, help you put up with me. <laughs> and really, I mean, I was supposed to say this before I even talked about prayer. But the point is, you know, it goes back to what, what does God want, right? You know, what, does, what is the Father's will in my life, you know? In prayer, am I aligning, am, am I trying to get my purposes into, into God's agenda? Or am I aligning myself to God's agenda? Okay? I'm going to give you uh, three examples. In my life, and I mentioned this in Wednesday service uh, as well, but in my life, the way I've seen God work, you know, through prayer and uh, do great things in my life, and I'm not saying I did miracles or anything, aside from the miracle that, you know, of salvation. That's a miracle itself, how God can just snatch us from, from darkness. Anyway, three things in my life that I've seen God work, done great things through prayer. Number one, uh, in 2000, 2006, you know, he told me, I was in San Bernardino, I was living over there, he told me, Come back to Yuma. I have a house for you. Okay, I want you to come back. So I, I obeyed. I came back with my family. I had a lot of naysayers. They said, "Oh, well, you're gonna you're, you're gonna end up, uh, you know, dead end job, and you're not you're gonna end up living in a trailer or something like that, right?" Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, the first week that my son was born, that's the first week I got the keys to my house, and we moved in, brand new, never had to rent. You know, again, not that there's anything wrong with renting, but. You know, the Lord answered that prayer. He sort of guided me through that, right? And I had to step out in obedience, right? Another, another thing, homeschooling, right? My kids, I never imagined to homeschool my kids. We think like, well, while they're in school, my, my wife can have free time, do what she wants, go to the gym. I can work, pay the bills, right? But it was one time we were listening to a message from Xavier Reese. Xavier Reese, he... Uh, he sort of was talking about family and, and marriage. He wasn't even talking about homeschooling. None of that. But we started getting convicted through that, how, you know, how much time they spend over here and influence, and then at home, but then they're watching TV, right? Or do you have to counter-educate your kids? You know, and we just got to start getting convicted. We called Xavier Reese up, and we told him, so what do you think about this, right? And he called us back. And he's like, yeah, go for it. And he prayed for us and this and that. And you know what? I haven't regretted it a minute that I homeschool my kids, you know. My daughter's more confident, you know, she's to be all shy, you know. She's, she, my, my wife taught my son how to read, you know, that's just a blessing. Not everybody gets to do that. Again, I'm not saying you got to homeschool your kids. It's up to you if the Lord leads you to do that. But that's number two, you know. Number two. Number three, being the pastor here, you know. Um, i just been the pastor here for about six months, but I had to act, in, I had to pray about it, obviously, right. Maybe the Lord had shown me that before through circumstances, right? He obviously showed it to Pastor Chuck. But see, these things that God has for us that, that we can see through prayer and pray about, they're not going to happen unless you act upon them, unless you, they're, they're His will. That's the point I'm trying to make. Greg Laurie says, Most prayers are not answered because they are outside the will of God. Once we have discovered God's will, we can then pray aggressively and confidently for it. We can pray believing it will happen. Because we know it is not something we have dreamed. And this is the third hope, the hope of prayer. We saw the hope of heaven, the hope of the rapture, and the hope of prayer here. You know, power behind prayer. You know all Jesus was doing? He was getting where the Father was already working. The, the, the religious leaders were going to stone Jesus because he said, um, you know, the Father has been working up until now. I have also been working. He was saying that him and the Father were very aligned, that they were working together, right? So in prayer, too, we're trying to find out where God is working.
so we can get where God is doing. And that's where we're going to see the prayers answered. That's where we're going to see, uh, uh, be a part of those great works that God is doing. Let's continue here to the next subject, the Holy Spirit, the substitute teacher. Verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, the helper, you know? And me, I'm not a handy guy, you know? I'm, I don't have a lot of tools, you know? I know a lot of men are like that. You know, they're good with cars and wrenches and all this. I'm more of a duct tape and WD-40 kind of guy. You know, I do most of, that stuff, my, most of the stuff with that. Or I pay somebody to do it, right? But, you know, we need help, and sometimes we're stubborn, right? And that, Jesus is going to take off, and he's bringing the Holy Spirit now to be their substitute teacher, to help him out. Let me give you an example here. A new resident was walking down a street and noticed a man struggling with the washing machine at the doorway of his house. When the newcomer uh, volunteered to help, the homeowner was overjoyed, and the two men together began to work and struggle with the bulky appliance. After several minutes of fruitless effort, the two stopped and just stared at each other in frustration. They looked as if they were on the verge of total exhaustion. Finally, when they had caught their breath, the first man said to the homeowner, We'll never get this washing machine in there. To which the homeowner replied, And I'm trying to move it out of here. They, they, they were working against each other, right? And that's the point I'm trying to make here. Men and, and you know people in general, Christians, right? We try to do things our way. But what does God tell us, you know? Unless the Lord builds, the laborer builds in vain, right? We need to get in God's will. See what, how he wants to build in our lives. And this is the fourth hope. Hope in the Holy Spirit, right? He's a substitute teacher for us. He's living inside of us. Verse 17 says, The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells, in, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice that there's three ministries or three relationships of the Holy Spirit. He's either uh, with you, in you, or upon you. You know? The word, Greek word para means that he'll be with you. That's found in what we just read. The Greek word epi means that he will be upon you. That's found in Acts chapter 1-8. When they're in the upper room there, right? They're praying and they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. He comes in the, they're speaking in tongues, right? He comes in the form of fire there, right? He comes upon you and that means he's going to empower you. And then the other Greek word, the third one, en, which means in. That's found in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. Where the Holy Spirit is in us, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? That's for believers only. So we see the three ministries of the Spirit. Verse 25 to 26, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Notice how he refers to the Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you, right? He refers to the Holy Spirit earlier on as a him and now as a he. Why? Why? Because he's a person. He's a third part of the Godhead here, right? He's not a force, not like Star Wars. Not, don't, don't believe the, the lie. Verse 18 to 20, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Here's the, the, the fifth hope. The hope of the resurrection. Okay? That's the linchpin of Christianity. Okay? His death and resurrection are just two pillars that hold up Christianity. Without them, we can't have it. Okay? He needed to die. He needed to resurrect. The resurrection gives us a hope that one day we too will live again. It's, it's the same thing he's telling him here. Because I live, you will live also. He encourages him, encourages him this, with this hope as well. Verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the love, what I call the love connection. Because even though God loves the whole world, right? He loved us while we were still sinners. He died for us, right? But why does he not manifest himself the same way he manifests himself to an unbelieving person? Is there different levels of love? Is there, is there something to it? And they're, they're actually, if you want to get the full extent of God's love, you need to obey Him. That's what He's saying in verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is He who loves me, and He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love Him and manifest myself to Him. Implying that He's not manifesting Himself to those that are not obeying His commandments. Very simple stuff. It's like wedding vows. It's not so much about the wedding vows, but about keeping the wedding vows. 
Doesn't matter if I say I love you uh, till death do us part, sickness or death, right? If I'm out sleeping around, right? It doesn't matter. It's about obeying. We need to be faithful to the word of God. And that means you're loving God back. You're loving the Lord through obedience. Greg Laurie says, every disciple is a believer, but not every believer is necessarily a disciple. You become a disciple in the biblical sense only when you're totally and completely committed to Jesus Christ and his words. But what are four practical ways that we can apply this to our lives? How can we obey his word? How can we get the most out of it, right? Here, are you taking notes? Are you talking about it with your kids after you leave here or meditating on and on it? When you go home, Bible studies, you know? Are you teaching your kids or grandkids? Are you teaching Sunday school, nursery, right? The teacher gets the most out of, out of uh, you know, they have to study. I get the most from this message because I have to study it throughout the week. I have to apply it, find this and that. You know, being a teacher, that's how you get the most out of God's word. Sharing what you learned with others, right? By putting God's word to the test, by applying it. That's part of inductive Bible study. What is it? Observe, interpret, apply what does it say? What does it mean? And what do I do about it? Is there a sin I have to repent of? If there's something I need to stop doing and start doing, all that is getting the most from God's word. And it's loving God back by obeying it. Right? This is the sixth hope. The hope in the word of God. What does David tell us? Psalm 119. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. I hate the double-minded, but love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. I like how the New Living renders it. Your word is my source of hope. There is hope in these words. You know, it's not so much about the ink and the, the, the shredded paper here. It's, it's about who they come from and what they mean and how we can apply them. Look what Paul tells us, Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, right? The scriptures bring us hope, the truth behind them as we apply them. If we go back to verse 23, he tells them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The other aspect about it, the blessing from it, right? You want full fellowship with God? Obey his word. He tells us elsewhere in the gospel of John, you know, to have uh, the fullness of joy, we need to abide in his commandments. And that's how we get it, abiding in His Word. Let's continue here, verse 27 and 31, to finish up. Love, peace, joy, and faith. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. This is the second time he says this, notice. Neither let it be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These guys were battling a, battle, uh, a fight with, with fear. They knew the enemy had possessed Judas already. Um, what happened? Uh, he, Jesus is going to be betrayed. He's taken off. He's going to be deserted. Right? All this stuff, you know? They knew somebody wanted to beat him up. The, the, they knew the devil wanted to sift him, sift him as wheat. Fear is the enemy of hope. We recently watched this movie, uh, what is it? Hunger Games? Part 2 or whatever. Uh, I like what this guy said. Uh, his name is President Snow. He's, uh, he's the bad guy, the villain. He said, um, hope, it is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. <laughs> so whether you have the fear of man, the fear of pub, uh, speaking in public, the fear of showing your toes in public or whatever, right? It, it, you know, fear is not from God. It, fear is, it, it, it comes from the enemy, okay? We, we, we build fear up. We, sh we shouldn't have it. We need hope. And God comes to, to bring this hope. He says here, I'm, I'm going to give you peace. Verse 27. Verse 28. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you will rejoice because I said I am going to my father. For my father, and here's that word again, greater. It keeps coming up. Greater than I am. Now it's talking about greater in position, not person. Okay? Greater in position. The father is not a, a greater God and the Son is a lesser God. That's not what it's talking about. He's greater in position, right? Same, same essence, different function. Let me give you an example. My wife and I, we're the same nature, right? Well, I'm, I'm a person. I'm a human being, right? She's a human being. But the Bible says in order for us to function good as a wife and husband, right? She needs to be under me, 
right? She needs to be submissive to me, and I need to love her as Christ loved the church, right? Some people might say, well, she, you're making her less than, than, than you, and that's not what it's saying. It's talking about function here when it says greater, right? The father called the shots. Jesus went out. Jesus followed the, the, was submissive to the father's will. Let me put it like that. Vice versa, as men, if our wives tells us, hey, go buy me some, I don't know, go buy me, go buy me some milk, okay? Go buy me some milk at the grocery store. And you happen to go. Does that make you less of a man? No, it doesn't, right? It does not make you less of a man. It just means you're working in love there. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was loving the Father perfectly. Verse 31, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me a commandment, so I do arise, let us go from here. And that's how the chapter ends. And we're going to go back to verse 30 real quick. But the upper room discourse, it's called the upper room discourse, chapters 13 to 17, because he starts talking to his disciples in the upper room. Okay? But is this saying, verse 31 saying that they took off from the upper room? Or were they already out of there from the previous chapter? I don't know. I, I still like to call it the upper room uh, discourse. But let's go back to verse 30 real quick. He says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. What is he saying? He's saying that the devil has got nothing upon, on Jesus. He's got nothing on him, right? Jesus is a prize fighter here. He, he, he cannot be beaten. He's sinless. The devil tried to tempt him, right? After Jesus was baptized in the wilderness, he's fasting, and he comes over here to tempt him with, with things of the world. How does Jesus fight back with God's word, right? He fights back with God's word, and he wins. But nevertheless, he says, it's time to go. The enemy here is coming. But he's got nothing on me. So we see here, let me review. Let's review the, the six hopes here. In heaven, we have hope, right? We have hope of heaven. We have the blessed hope. That's the rapture. The resurrection, the hope of the resurrection. That's the linchpin of Christianity. We have the hope of the power of prayer. The hope of the Holy Spirit, being comforted by the Spirit. And the hope of the Word of God. Let's finish with this verse found in Psalms 42.5. It says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise Him again, my Savior and my God. Let's pray. As you guys have your heads bowed, and don't worry, we're about to pray right now, but as you have your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if there is somebody here that does not have the hope of Jesus Christ. You know, raise your hand. And you want that hope for that matter, right? If you don't know Jesus, if you don't have the hope of heaven yet, raise your hand now. What's stopping you? You can have that. It's a gift, remember? It's grace, not by works. Do you want hope in Jesus? Do you want hope that, you, that when you die, your next breath will be a heavenly breath? You'll be in heaven again one day? Raise your hand now if that's you, if the Lord has been convicting you through this message, through His Word. Praise God, I don't see any hands. You're all saved. Lord, we pray, we ask that you would just continue to speak to us. Lord, we want to take advantage of these benefits we have, Lord. These life insurance benefits. We've got the benefit of the Holy Spirit, the benefit of uh, heaven, the benefit of uh, the rapture, Lord. Lord, help us take advantage of these, Father God. We want to use them, Lord, to the fullest extent, Lord. We want more of you and less of us. Father, as we finish up praying here, we pray that you be with us. We know your spirit is with us. We want your spirit to be upon us so we can have power to be used by you. Nevertheless, upon your will, Lord. Lord, we pray that we might worship you in spirit and truth now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.